we are uh, rounding out the bottom five of our top 25 Bengals for 2023. Uh, we are already flying through this list, and uh, we're going to keep flying through this list because it has been fun. There has been no shortage of good discussions and a lot of comparisons, which, you know, who would who would have thought we'd be comparing BJ Hill to Shirobi Awuzie, but that's why these podcasts are so awesome. Today we got number 20 on our list, new Bengals safety, Nick Scott, what he brings, where he ranks on the list, why he ranks on the list, where he does. We're going to talk about the end. We're going to read another fun fan story to follow up on the one we read Monday. Welcome into a Tuesday edition of the Top 25 Strictly Stripes edition of this podcast. Muhammad Ahmad along with Andrew Gillis and Mike Nislik. Speaking of Bengals fan stories, I have loved reading these stories. I'm sure Andrew and Mike feel the same way about hearing these stories. If you want to tell us your story of how, when, where, and why you became a Bengals fan, go to cleveland.com and actually no go to strictly stripes.com that's gonna be, it's gonna be an easier link strictly stripes.com go to that link you're gonna see uh another link that says why well, i'm a Bengals fan tell us your story click on that fill out the google form that asks all these questions that i mentioned or if you're old school and it's easier email us directly at stripes at cleveland.com and we are gonna be reading pretty much all of these all the way through training camp which is in exactly a month from today, which is hard to believe. So you are carrying us through training camp. You are driving this podcast. So make sure you fill that out and uh, have fun with us. All right, Nick Scott at number 20. And just to recap, uh, the other names that we have talked about in this podcast already, for those who haven't heard, number 25, we had Lyle Collins, 24, Miles Murphy, 23, Dax Hill, 22, Irv Smith Jr. And yesterday being Monday, we had BJ Hill, and now Nicholas Scott. So this is interesting because um, he's one of the, f- I, I don't know exactly. I'd have to look through the list, but he's one of the few people, if not one of the only people, one of the few only people on this list uh, who was not a Bengal last year, who was a Bengal this year um, on this list. I'm sure you probably guessed the other one, Orlando Brown. He is also going to be on this list way later. Um uh, there's when we two talk others, about that. That's oh, okay. okay, wait. Oh, yeah, you're right. You are right. I stand corrected on that. It's Nick Scott. It's Orlando Brown and uh, Irv Smith, who we just talked about. So, yeah, you're right. I, I can't even and, count today. And Miles <laughs> Murphy. Well, I'm I'm talking in terms of active players who <laughs> active players who were on other teams last year. Miles Murphy's a rookie, a rookie, so he's in a special category. That's why he's really cool. Okay, so Nick Scott. Um, of course, we don't know. What to completely expect because he's only played one year as a starter and he played in a completely different defense with the L.A. Rams, which is nothing like uh, Louis Rumo's defense, for better or worse. So before I ask you guys where you had him on your list and why you, you placed him there, how, how much did you kind of consider like where he played last year, like with the Rams, with Sean McVay, with Raheem Morris? Did, did that factor into – you know, making that decision or was it just more so what he did on the field, regardless of who he played for? Well, I mean, it, it, it has to, right? I mean, there, there's a reason that the Bengals went after him that there's a reason that, you know, he kind of, I, I mean, there, there's, I mean, if, if we weren't really taking that into account, I mean, what would we be taking into account? So, uh, I mean, you're looking at a guy who, who didn't really play a lot until their Super Bowl run. Um, and, and by play a lot, I mean, on defense, you know, he was a pretty, pretty core special teams player. Um, you know, but then he, he starts in, uh, in the playoff run, he, he kind of makes an impact there and he, he obviously makes 16 starts last year. So I, I, you, you have to take that into account, right? You, that, that's just not something you can ignore. Um, but yeah, I, I you, you have to look at it kind of what he did and say, and I almost, oh my God, I almost said St. Louis. Um, well, I'm going to do that for forever. Um, but, uh, you, you have to look at what he did with the Rams, um, you know, in, in LA, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, you can kind of see that the arrow is, is trending up for him. Um, but, you know, I, I had him, uh, you know, personally, I, I had him ranked at, at 20. Um, you know, I, I had him uh, uh, I had him there just because you, you look at kind of some of the other guys that have that have been ahead of him and, and some of the ar- other arguments that we've had. I mean, it's just hard to put him, you know, ahead of a, of a Jonah Williams, even a guy who was injured for, for a lot of last year and kind of fighting through some pain. And, you know, a guy like Cam Taylor Britt who played really well for this team at the end of the year, I thought, you know, th- there's just, it, it's a tough argument to make, but um, I think, I think you're feeling pretty good about what he did. You just, you just have to see it first. 
Yeah, I don't know necessarily. I don't think he played all. I mean, he wasn't. Uh, I mean, it was fine. Um, but I'd I'd be a little worried. I don't I don't think you have sort of um as a lock that he's a successful fit for this team. I think that's why they drafted a safety too. Um, you know, I I think that what he does do is upgrade the uh, athleticism in the room. Uh, another guy that. Uh, ran like a four four when he ran the forty. Um, you know, has all those physical tools, uh, but I think he needs coaching and and you know build on that experience to get sort of better. Because I mean, he was okay, but um, you know, Von Bell. I mean, I think they're going to certainly v- miss. You know, him and Von Bell were uh, the same age, but they're going to miss that veteran savvy that Von Bell brought to the lineup, and that helped him overcome some of the limitations he had as an athlete. Um, but but, um, you know, paired with Dax Hill, I probably would rather have a guy that's a little less a- athletic and has more experience. But uh, we'll see with what the tools, that, you know, that Nick Scott brings to the lineup, what the uh, coaching staff can can get out of him. So I'm looking at your all's rankings of where you had Nick Scott. So, Mike, you had him at 21. Andrew, you had him at 19. I had him right in the literal sweet spot, which is 20. So we were all pretty close. Like no one was really farther off than the other. Like, I mean, you guys were only one spot off, you know, behind or in front of number 20. So, yeah, I mean, for me, 20 just makes sense. I think 20 is just like, like I said, it's the sweet spot because, you know, yeah, I think like you look at the other guys we had ahead, like, you know, uh, BJ Hill, Dax Hill, Miles Murphy, Lyle Collins, like, Yes, the role is important, but like what Nick Scott is going to do, like in pass coverage, and it's I think we talked about this too when it came to like Dax Hill and you know Andrew mentioned the whole idea of you can make a story about you know Dax Hill versus Miles Murphy in terms of who should be ranked higher. I think you could make the same argument, you know, with Nick Scott versus Miles Murphy or Nick Scott versus B.J. Hill, you know, two uh, defensive linemen who were ranked below him who we were saying, could they have been ranked higher? Well, I don't know. I think Nick Scott has to be ranked higher because even if they don't get to the quarterback, B.J. Hill, uh, Miles Murphy, if either of them can't get to the quarterback as much as they can, as much as they should, it's, it's going to fall down to – it's going to come down to Nick Scott to be able to stop those pass plays. And here's the thing. Like, I think we've said this, you know, about Nick Scott many times, and we mentioned this with Dax Hill on his top 25 pod, like – that safety room is going to be tested. Like I can already imagine like Andy Reed and Sean McDermott and all, all these coaches, John Harbaugh, like they're just going to look at that safety duo and say, okay, we're not dealing with Vaughn Bell anymore. We're not dealing with Jesse Bates anymore. We're dealing with a first year starter and a second year starter. Cause obviously uh, Scott only started one year with the Rams and four seasons there, second year starter and a rookie, another rookie with Jordan battle who, disclaimer, he did not make this list, of course. But, yeah, I mean, you got a rookie, first-year starter, and second-year starter. It's not a lot of experience. And I do see the argument that Mike makes for kind of wishing you had Von Bell back there because, yeah, he's more of a hard hitter versus a versatile athletic guy, but that experience did a lot in that defensive backfield. And it's why the Bengals had some of the best red zone defense uh, in the NFL. So I do think it's – I don't think you can really rank him any higher. I I think – yeah, it's, you know, maybe 19, maybe, because I, I know, Andrew, you had him at uh, at 19. I, I could see that, but I, I was going to say for you, like, for you, Andrew, since you had him a little bit higher, I want to kind of go to you on this. Since you had him at 19, why do you feel like he's higher than, say, like, you know, I don't know. I'm just looking here. Like, you had him, you had him higher than Joe Mixon. You had Joe Mixon at number 21 on your list. Like, why do you believe – he's higher than Joe Mixon. Cause that I think is a little bit interesting on your list. Well, I, I think, you know, if, if you're talking Nick Scott versus Joe Mixon, I, I have questions about what Joe Mixon's role is going to be this year. I think, you know, kind of one of the under discussed storylines of this off season is, I mean, some, I mean, look, I understand he's a rookie, but if, if there were a position that, that a running back can, or that, a, excuse me, if there were a position that a player can come in, you know, as a fifth round pick and make an immediate impact, I, I would lean running back as as kind of the, you know, the the number one spot there where where I think it would be easiest to come in and 
and kind of grab a full-time role. I mean, it's really hard to do that at, at some of these other positions. You know, you think of, I mean, God forbid quarterback, but I mean, you think of like corner or, you know, pass rusher or receiver, like it's just, it's a really difficult spot to come in and, and play. So I, I have questions about what Joe Mixon's going to do kind of on the field, just as, you know, as it relates to him, I don't know what his, uh, what his play is going to look like in 2023. And I think Chase Brown's kind of nipping at his heels a little bit. And I, I think that when, when it comes down to it, I would not be surprised if Chase Brown starts to take carries away from Joe Mixon as the season goes along, mm. because, you know, I, I understand Chase Brown had a lot of carries at Illinois and I understand that, you know, he's uh, you know, he's, he's not really one of these like high pedigree backs, quote unquote, like a Zach Charbonnet or, um, you know, I, I mean, a Bijan's obviously kind of kind of up there or Jameer Gibbs, but he, he's not kind of one of those guys. And I understand that he, he doesn't really come with the, um, um, you know, with the notoriety that those guys do. But I, but I do think that, you know, some of those younger legs, those fresher legs, you might be able to get more out of him late in the year. So I, I just again, I, I just don't think Joe Mixon is uh, is going to have a, a terribly significant rebound year. I, I think that um, you know that you're kind of on the downswing of his uh, of his Bengals career here. That is interesting, and uh, yeah, like obviously Mixon is on this list, but we'll get to him later as well. Like with other names I mentioned, um, this is an interesting thing I wanted to ask you, Mike. So all of us had Mike Hilton above Nick Scott. Um, but you had Mike Hilton at number 20 because you had Nick Scott at number 21. Um, I guess, again, we all agree Mike Hilton's going to have a, a bigger, more important role than Nick Scott and is a, a better player just based on experience and talent. But that is interesting. Num- number 20. I don't know. That's kind of low, don't you think? Well, and it Hilton. speaks to the, the fact that he's, I mean, we'll, we'll get to him, I, you know, in, in a bit but um in terms of where he's at on his final list on the list but um just the the fact that he's a a, a nickel and he's not necessarily an every down player um you know i ranked him lower you know i, I just i don't know i feel like some of the guys you know cam taylor Britt. obviously i was well, somebody to put ahead of him because he's gonna you know never leave the field um and so it just kind of was preference just based on uh positional importance um not necessarily mike helton i think mike helton's talent is there but um in terms of um just you know that nickel spot um just ha- has less of an impact sometimes than I, than I think other positions do well that was interesting yeah because you know, i mean we all agree like mike hilton is very talented and you know he's talented enough to be on this list of course um but i don't know i just thought like you know with nick scott being a you know like a lot with a lot of question marks which mike hilton does not have i just thought huh that's kind of interesting that you know, a guy like Mike Hilton ahead of Nick Scott, but not too far behind him. I thought that was interesting. But before we get to break, um, I know I've asked this with every player, but there I think is a good discussion to have with Nick Scott on this question. So like we mentioned, he's going to be tested. Him and Dax Hill both are going to be tested. How, not how much, that's the wrong way to phrase it. What do you have to see from Nick Scott to feel like, okay, he wasn't Vaughn Bell good, but he was good enough to not be a disappointment at his position. Um, you know, with 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 Nick Scott, I think kind of a successful year would be if, if frankly, if you, if you don't notice him a ton. Uh, and I know that kind of sounds backwards. And um, you know, I, I I think this kind of just goes into the to the DJ Reader kind of discussion we had about BJ Hill yesterday. Like, I, I I'm actually really high on the Bengals' corners this year. Um, you know, I think. Uh, Cheeto is going to have a really good year. I think Cam Taylor Britt played really well at the end of the year. Obviously, Mike Hilton, you know, is in as a really, really good slot corner. And I just think that you know they they boosted the pass rush a little bit. Uh, you have Miles Murphy now, uh, so you feel better about that position. I think you feel better about corner than you did a year ago. Your linebackers remain the same. Uh, and you know, yeah, you, you lose, you know, Jesse Bates and you lose, uh, Von Bell and, and, and that's a pretty significant blow, but I just think that with that in front of them, um, I, 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 I have questions about how much they're really going to be asked to do or, or kind of be forced to do. I think, you know, Lou Anarumo is going to be aware of that, that, you know, Jesse losing Jesse Bates is not a small thing and, and losing Von Bell is not a small thing. So I think that if, you know, if you can just kind of get a veteran presence in the backfield, because again, 
you know, you've got, you've got Cheeto coming back from, from a knee and, you know, you, you've got him, he's a veteran player, but Cam Taylor Britt, second year player, Mike Hilton, veteran player. And you've got Dax Hill, who's a second year player who really didn't play a lot. You, you've got some young guys in that secondary, you know, you've got some inexperience in that secondary. I think if Nick Scott can just play a veteran role in the sense that he knows where to be, he knows where to line up. He, he does, he's not really phased by anything. He's played in big games before. Like, obviously, like, I, I just think that if you can get that from him and get kind of steady back end play where you, you don't really notice any glowing errors, I think that you're going to be, you're going to be feeling pretty good about what he did in 2023. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, that's fair. I, I just think, I, I think it does come, come down to performance, you know, in terms of, um, if teams just, you know, find that as a weakness, you know, find going, you know, you know, you know the deep ball and their coverage in the, in the back end uh, suffers for it. I think you're going to be, um, you know, when he loses snaps or, or, you know, Jordan battle gets a tryout. Um, I think that's kind of the clear, um, you know, if he, he fails, I mean, I think you're going to start looking to see Jordan battle getting put in there a little bit um, to see if he can handle it. Cause um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't think Nick Scott's, I mean, he only has one year of starting experience under his belt. I don't think it's a, a lock that he just comes in and, and is, you know, the, the answer. So I, I think if um, he struggles, um, you'll see that you'll see, um, you know, some snaps going elsewhere. It's kind of like last year when um, I think this was when they played Atlanta in week five or week six, one of those weeks that they played the Falcons or we, I guess it was like week six, week seven, it was a little later than that. And you saw Eli Apple kind of lose some snaps to Cam Taylor Britt. And I know Louie and Aruma mentioned, Oh, the plan was to put Cam in there, but, I don't think it was coincidental that that happened while Eli Apple, like we saw how he played first half of the year, did not play well. I know he rebounded second half of last year and he pretty much had to since Chidobe Awuzie went down. But yeah, I mean, I think if Chidobe Awuzie stayed healthy and Eli Apple kept playing the way he did in the first half of the season, I think he could have lost his job to Taylor Britton. So if the same thing happens to Nick Scott where Jordan Battle either takes more of your snaps or just takes your, your job altogether, then... I think that's the easy answer. Yeah, like that that's how you know he he wasn't playing well. And and of course that depends on what Lou Anarumo wants, what Zach Taylor wants, how they want what they want. But yeah, that that's the interesting dynamic with Jordan Battle is like how they use him could definitely determine like how they use uh, Nick Scott and what they think of him. When we come back, we are going to read one of our fan responses. This is going to be a fun one. They've all been fun, but um I already kind of read this uh, you know, just to get a head start on it. And it's been pretty good. And I'm excited to read this to you guys. When we come back, we'll have that response right here on the Strictly Stripes podcast. Hey, guys, if you love college football, we think you'll like the College Football Survivor Show. I'm Doug Maurice, and my co-host Shahan Jeharaja and I, each week we talk about the best programs, best coaches, best players in the sport. It's all football, no off-field stuff, no legislation. It's about the teams that are going to matter most in the playoff race. Will Georgia three-peat? Always on the lookout for angry Bama. The Big Ten, Ohio State and Michigan battling at the top and Penn State on the rise. The Pac-12 matters again, not just USC, but Oregon and Washington as well. The playoff is expanding. Expand your podcast listening try the college football survivor show wherever you find podcasts all right thanks for staying with us on the strictly stripes podcast so we talked about nick scott uh why his role is imperative what the bengals are gonna need from him next year and uh, what a successful and not so successful season could or could not look like we are gonna shift gears and read one of our Bengals top fan responses and like i said we've read i think about three up to this point. Uh, we read two last week, read one yesterday. Going to read another one today, and we might get to some more later this week. Uh, yesterday was a Columbus, Ohio fan. This is another Columbus, Ohio fan. This is from Daniel L. Burke from Columbus. Here we go. Okay, this is what Daniel had to say. Back in the day, before the Bengals were even formed, I was a Cleveland Brown fan because all of my uncles and kin were, parentheses, maybe the fact that our last name was Brown had something to do with it, end parentheses, but the Browns got stupid and traded away my favorite player, Paul Warfield, parentheses, did also say that my family were big Ohio State fans for Mike Phillips. Excuse me if I spelled his name wrong. I think he got the spelling right. I cut loose the Browns, and after the Dolphins, where Warfield was traded to, won the Super Bowl. I followed them until Cincinnati was formed, and I've been a Bengals fan ever since. So the the common I've noticed a common thread here. So 
we read Sandy Douglas's response yesterday. She's from Columbus, like I mentioned. She became a Bengals fan because her brother was a Browns fan. So it was kind of like a get back at you kind of thing. And then this guy, Daniel, uh, becomes a Bengals fan because he was a Browns fan. And then, you know, all the stuff happened with Paul Warfield, who I think is still the goat at his position, one of the goats at his position, uh, an OG from that time. So it's just like, man, I mean, obviously, so the Bengals were formed in 68. The Browns were formed. I think they, they came to Cleveland in 1946. They were in, I think they were in LA before that, or I could be wrong. They were like, they were like in LA and then they came to Cleveland and then the Rams went to LA. It was a weird movement, but point is the Browns were like around for two and a half decades longer. And all these fans just started jumping ship to Cincinnati. So I'm just curious, like, do you guys think like Columbus is that dividing line where it's like, okay, south of Columbus automatically convert to Bengals fans north of that stay loyal to the Browns. And then Columbus is kind of that buffer. Like, th- does that make sense to you guys? I-, I think that's unofficially what it is, right? Um. You know, I, I would say that, you know, Columbus is still more Browns fans. I mean, you know, kind of like we've heard from some of these fans, right? Like, you know, the the Bengals weren't a thing. And, and you know, we, we obviously know that, you know, especially in, you know, this part of the country and, and you know, I mean, fan dynamics are, are insanely interesting, but, you know, fan like fandom stays in families, um, you know, for, for a lot of these people. And I mean, you know, if you were born in, in 1960, um, you know, which means right around the time, I mean, you're, you're getting close to, to grandparent age type thing. You're getting close to retirement. Um, you know, if you were born in, in 1960, you grew up a Browns fan and that probably means your kids were Browns fans too. And their kids were Browns fans. So like, I, I don't know. I just think that, um, I, I think that that changes. I think dynamics are changing now with, with the league just kind of being what it is with sports in general being what it is. I mean, you can get every game on your, on your, on your uh, laptop you can stream it illegally if you wanted to you know you can you can be a fan of the Raiders living in Nashville Tennessee just because you can watch them any week you want um, you know so there, there's a bunch of stuff with that but I think Columbus is a fair dividing line I still think it I, I like look I understand this might not make Bengals fans very happy I think it's I think it is a brown state uh, I think it's changing a little bit just because of you know fan dynamics changing I think you know, as, as the Bengals get uh, better and better, you know, they have Joe Burrow, they have Jamar Chase. They're really likable. I think that that changes things as well, but um, yeah, I, Columbus, I mean, to me, uh, this is very anecdotal, but Columbus to me feels just kind of people I met, people I've talked to feels like the Brown city. Now you granted could, Ohio state carries the rock, you know, in Ohio. Oh, of course. Let's, yes. Absolutely. Let's be honest here. Like there are a lot of people from Ohio who, you know, if you would ask them who their favorite football team is college or pro, they're saying the Buckeyes. So. Mike, I don't know if you've been to Columbus uh, or if you've been there as much as Andrew and I have been, but like, do you do you get that sense that like it's more Browns country up there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been there a few times. I have not talked to Browns football when I've gone. Um, you know, I, I think it's the league is fandom shifting to more player based. You know, I think fans root for guys in college and then root for them in the pros. I don't think that there's necessarily um, as much. You know, I'm focused on one team. I think. Um, you know, it's it's personality and player driven now, especially with social media um, and players uh, getting a following. So um, I don't think it's as tied to one team as it used to be or in the last decade or two. Like Andrew said, since you can get every game, you don't have to follow just one team. You can follow whoever you want. And so that combined with, you know, players, I think having, um, you know, Patrick Mahomes, I would imagine is a lot of, uh, a pretty good reason that there's a lot of Chiefs fans that are outside of Kansas City. Um, Joe Burrow can be the same way for for the Bengals, but um, so I, I don't know necessarily that you know boundaries or or state lines matter anymore. So, do you think it's okay to be a Browns fan and a Joe Burrow fan? I mean, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it is. I mean, some Brown diehards probably wouldn't like it, but no, I'm sure there are plenty of people that feel that way, especially since um, he did go to Ohio State briefly, and that there are that's true connections to the state. Yeah, I say I think there. Yeah, you can make an exception for Burrow because yeah, he went to Ohio State. Uh, he was with Urban Meyer. He played in Athens uh, High School. Won Mister Football his senior year. So I think with Burrow you can do that. But like, if you were like say a Bengals fan, but like a um, I'm already forgetting his name, Nick Chubb fan, then I I could see people being like like the Bengals diehards, like oh wow, you chose Nick Chubb over Joe Mixon. I don't know. I feel like that that is kind of what's happening. Like. 
who knows? You mentioned Mahomes. How many how many Bengals fans are secretly Patrick Mahomes fans? Now that would create a lot of ruckus because I mean, you know, the Burrow Mahomes debate that's in favor of Mahomes right now, but who knows if that changes and that's just gonna stir up the pot some more. But that is interesting. I wonder how many people survey this stuff because this is actually kind of cool to me. But um yeah, the 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 whole dynamic of like the Browns and the Bengals and the Columbus split, I I want to see if it's a 60-40 split, a 70-30 split in favor of the Browns. I, I want to know that demographic and see how far that line stretches east. Like, does it cut off in Athens? Does it go more south of that and like the Appala- Appalachian part of Ohio? That's interesting to me. And I know Joe Burrows talked about that, so maybe um, look, look, look into that some more. That's a story of itself. Uh, but stay with us. Wednesday, we're going to talk about our uh, number 19 player on the list, and that is Bengals – Soon to be right tackle Jonah Williams, who obviously uh, played left tackle last year and every year before that. Going to talk about him, his future, his outlook, and his ranking on this list. And make sure you sign up for our Strictly Stripes newsletter. It's free. It's in your inbox every morning. Go to uh, cleveland.com slash newsletters and sign up. And you get the best reporting in your inbox every day of the week. Once again, for myself, Andrew and Mike, I'm Muhammad Ahmad. See you Wednesday.